Chapter 8 Draconum's Follower Draconum is rushing past deep hues of green, scant brown, scurrying squirrels, and a boar in the underbrush. Leaves are whispering in the wind amidst birds gossiping. Twigs and branches are tugging at her dress as she goes under and over them until they thin. Grown steps and grunts are getting closer. To her side she sees his visage, his longer legs stretching out further until she is viewing his backside. Further in front he gets to her frustration. She leaps over branches and rocks as the sacred time speeds on. She pushes on. Her mind is racing with delirium by the time she approaches a short cliff. She doesn't allow herself to stop. She anticipates sliding down. Then abruptly, she leaps and spreads her arms as if infirm. Eyes closed, she begins to glide over the brush. Then up she goes over the treetops, mind on the location of the elves. Slowly opening her eyes, she feels nostalgic. The majestic forest glistens as if birch, pine, and cedar are the forest of emeralds and jade. Momentarily, she forgets her purpose. Momentarily, she feels overwhelmed by ecstasy of being above it all, with the rushing wind over her face, flapping of her clothes, and warm sun on her back. That is, until she realizes that she is indeed above it all. Fright takes over. The giant white wings that were once her arms now shrink down back to its original small slim appendages, abruptly sending her tumbling down into the redwood. How could this be? There is no time to consider. Ah! She screams madly with her heart swelling in her bosom, trying to grip branches as they slap and sting her. No part of her is safe from the abuse. A few breaks with of her weight and slithers of bark slide into her palm as more twigs stings accumulate. Grunting, she holds fast to a mid-sized branch. She shifts her weight, swinging her legs despite her throbbing, burning hands and flings her right leg over, followed by the left. Inching her way down, she sport, she spots an Ian in a lower branch. Hearing her, the cat smoothly makes its way for her by flinging its miraculous tail around some of the branches. It patiently waits for her to climb onto its back. Then with ease, it makes its way down. On the ground, she removes the wood from her palm with a yelp of pain. Every part of her aches and throbs, but there is no time to fuss. She kindly strokes the cat's shiny black coat, speculating her distance from the disoriented, endangered elf. Can you take me a mile to the east? She coos, rubbing its nose with hers to appease it. I'm in a hurry. Without hesitation, the eon whips its able tail around, nudging her close, providing a good leverage for her to climb on again. She swings her leg over and grips its musty fur, leaning down to hold on to him tightly. It isn't as smooth as a horse ride, if you can call that smooth. This is far worse. She bounces, matching her crotch bone uncomfortably. She scrunches her face hard, enduring it. Her tight grip loosens from time to time as she readjusts, hoping to be there soon. The constant bouncing stirs her innards. It threatens in her throat. The seconds are as hours in this miserable state. But then, clanking of the steel, brushing and crunching on the ground comes louder with each jolt to her now delicate gut. Draconum's eyes are shut, but as she feels the eon's front paws rise, they open. Its back legs leap into the air. She views the skirmish as they descend into it. It appears as chaos. Frightful tingling sensations blister about in her stomach. She spots Leof on a lasagna, a four-legged creature that appears cross between a 
rhinoceros, llama, and horse, along with a few other armored elves. She notes that Hurrian is targeting a netting jar with his claws bracing for impact. Nervously, she leaps off her cat, tucking herself into a ball and rolling onto the ground. Springing up, she finds herself at the backside of a netting jar, overpowering a weaponless elf covered in soil. Heaving with all of her might, she thrashes upon the nightcrawler's skull with her staff before it strikes its hook into the helpless elf. The creature staggers. The blood oozes from its exposed head. Elves, animals, and net and jars are all dancing around her. Another net and jar notices just what occurred. It issues a growling before it comes at her with its nasty blade. She kind of retorts. Back and forth they go, with the net and jar forcing her backwards. His swings are much faster and harder than hers. And it seems the way he's hacking at her staff that he's trying to break it. He changes maneuvers, frustrated. And eventually, he's able to twist her staff out of her hands. He thrusts it to the ground behind him. His lips rise in a threatening manner. He goes at her again, relentless. The first net and jar she hit is regaining his senses and getting up with his gnarly blade in hand. Without pause, she pulls her dagger from its sheath and stretches her bloodied, bruised hand to the relentless net and jar, making his swing. Pops, oh, Adora, she shouts, releasing a jet of flame from her palm. The startled net and jar jumps back, hysterically beating the flames off his chest. Taking advantage, she lunges forward with her dagger, slicing its upper shoulder. The fire spreads quickly on the creature's garments. He drops his weapon and himself on the ground and rolls. Draconum too rolls. She goes towards the oncoming Nedinjar, stabbing it in the groin as she rises up. Screaming, he swings this hook with the diminished force, now just tearing her sleeve and scraping her skin. She spins around for another jab, but he is too quick, and he blocks her with his hook. She stumbles from his force, but she holds fast to her dagger. He lunges at her again. Kala mesmat mina igus, she chants, stepping back to watch her ice strike his chest as he lifts his hands to strike down upon her. She spins out of the way from his fall, only to face the burnt one, who was already ready with his nasty sword. Before she can block his swing, the blade clanks against her bone, dragon bone, breastplate. She takes advantage and steps in, dag driving her dagger into his neck. His end is quick. Sweat beads upon her brow, and her breath is heavy as she pivots around in search of more enemies. The clatter clank screams, and shouts have quieted into a low chatter and sighs of relief. There are a few last swings and desperate attempts to flee by the Nanajar. The struggles fade, death, wounded, and exhausted faces abound. The Yo and soldiers are now busy helping bandage the injured. All of the eyes fall upon her smiling. She thinks that she spots Bodhi. Oh, Bodhi! she exclaims, seeking the answers in the eyes of the Yo carrying him on the stretcher. Knocked out cold, lady! The heavy breathing Yo explains, reassuring her with gentle voice and gestures. He is brave for a council member. He stammers, looking apologetic. I mean, er, Fernway pats Draconum on the back. What he means is the soft alpha was here first. And if it wasn't for the Chatha there, he would be a goner. He says, pointing to a Chatha walking away from the scene nonchalant. He sent the bird that alerted us, the soldier informs her. Oh, Draconum responds, peering around at all the faces. A soldier and female elf abruptly flings her arm around Dracunum. Oh, thank you. I knew it was you. 
You are the one. To cut him questions, Brock pinned Yes! Oh, it was you ripping us out of the ground, giving us air, freeing us, the elf proclaims. Three other elves surround her and join in. Draconum smiles, trying to lift her mouth from their shoulders to speak, but another male elf speaks, denying her. I am so grateful to you, the yo, to Hafjar, for giving us a liberator, he expresses gratefully. Praise Hafjar, all of our ancestors, for giving us a savior, Jacronum, the first female elf proclaims. Well, um, Jacronum mumbles, trying to break away gently from the tight hold they have on her. I had help. Grown, my cousin, is actually the one who pulled you out of the ground, and the, the yo soldiers, the animals, were here to protect you. Leof is dismounting. She looks on with her fellow Yo. All their eyes cause Jacanum to feel humble, to feel small. I am Lilac, the sore coated female announces. I am pleased to meet you. I love you, and I would gladly fight by your side, though I'm really just a cook. Pride soars through Jacanum, receiving recognition and praise, yet it is overwhelming her. Jacanum opens her mouth, but another elf proves faster. I am Vikey. I work at the meeting house serving food and running errands. I'm in the know, he informs with wide eyes, shaking his head proudly. If you ever need to know anything, privy, he peers around shyly. I am loyally yours to command. Command, she wonders, as her eyes rove over the crowd forming around her. Koro, my lady. Another old elf declares, bowing. I work at the school, and I used to stare at the books, longing to read them. But thanks to you, I can. His eyes gleam as he lowers himself and takes her hand. He presses his lips to it, undaunted by the grass and blood upon it. I am forever grateful. Not to mention that you just saved my life from who knows what horrors they had in store for me. My life is yours. He steps aside. To reveal a young elf, leaving Drukhanum to stare at his display, wide eyes and taken aback. My gift is my voice, honorable lady Drukhanum, seed of Husami, the young elf says, bowing low. I am not yet at my naming. For now, I am just Walnut. But you can call me any time. I am yours. I would be, it would be an honor to sing for you and your family. He winks at Jaconum flirtatiously. Jaconum is flattered and just speechless. Awkwardness pervades her mien. Years she has daydreamed of being hailed and praised, but this somehow is different. Perhaps her dreams and imaginings were just that, and she never quite believed them to materialize. All the same, here she is, besieged with service and no idea of how to adequately respond. With Hall, it doesn't end with the commoners. Matson Du is fast approaching, possessing words avid to share. Matson Du, head of the Yo, he announces, bowing. I am at your service, Lady Draconum Husami. I did recognize those Yo maneuvers you used. I see that you have grown skilled after all. Impressive. Leuf is an excellent teacher, he states. His, his eyes peer over at Leuf a moment before returning to Draconum. He opens his shawl, exposing her symbol, embroidered white and blue. Yes, Draconum says, replies meekly. She is stunned. The crude drawing she created in a letter to her mother is there improved and beautifully depicted on his prayer shawl. She finds it hard to pull her eyes away from it. She has no words. She had no idea. Her smallest deeds have taken off as confetti in the wind, or storm, or fire in a dry grass. Matindu pats his hand, puts his hand upon Draconum's shoulder and pats it. All the yo is yours, he assures her as if reading her thoughts. The first soldier she spoke with gingerly smiles and bows. Um, I can't speak for the entire army, noble Draconum Husami, 
but most of us are yours. You stand for us. We should have known, being your father, who he was. He is my hero, madame. I will follow you. Command me, honorable lady. I will comply. A single clapping of hands comes from the back of the crowd. Most spin around to view the face of the clapper. It is grown on top of a black bear. Draconum shakes her head at him, relieved at his timely appearance. Thanks for that, old gal, he tells the bear. He turns his attention to Draconum. Mighty fine rebellion you have. I could have not done better myself. You're late, Draconum retorts, feeling flushed and wanting to just run away. She turns to Lilac. This is the one who pulled you out of the ground. Groan continues towards Draconum, enjoying the eyes upon him. Oh, we know well enough who he is, Koa replies, peering around, then straight into Groan's eyes. I would not have guessed it being, uh, I mean, um, your reputation. Uh-huh, you mean jerk. Groan asserts with a sly grin. Yeah, I was vexatious, Vian. But that was in. This is now. I am Lord Groan Husami, putting my talents of scheming to good use, wouldn't you say? Uh huh. Thank you. I am. Coro style stalls, staring at Groan warily a moment. In your debt as well. Hearing this, Groan's eyes become brilliant as rays of the sun. Draconum sees a twist of glint in it. She immediately interjects. Oh no, you would have done the same if it were you. No need for debts. What if I like debts? Groan protests. Are you part of it? Matin Dew asks Groan, face rounded eye and Groan's plant fingers. Before any more could be said, the sound of hooves arrests their attention. Farfadir and a group of yo are riding up on Lazenyas. Part of what? Farf dear asks as he draws near. Part of the rescue, Draconum asserts before anyone else can speak. Hello, my name is Dietrich Kellogg. I'm an artist, illustrator, writer, and I hope you enjoyed today's story, Draconum's Followers, from the White Wizard of Hot Doors series. Book two, Collective Minds. As usual, like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And please, if you have comments, share. I will gladly get back to you. Oh, questions, questions, right. If you have questions, please put it in the comments. I will get back to you as soon as possible. If you haven't read book one, I'm pretty sure you do have some questions. And I would like to answer them and clear any confusion up. And if you have some suggestions, I am open to whatever you have to say. So thank you very much, my subscribers. I love you so very much. Like, like, subscribe, share with your friends. And until next time. She spots Leif on a lasagna. 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 <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh...